All right, all right. Um, Assalamualaikum to our Muslim brothers and sisters out there, and I have a good evening to all the non-Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, thank you so much for signing up for uh, Let's Stop Cryptocurrency. Uh, all right, and we are setting our slides right now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, on a Monday evening. Uh, this is actually the last talk in our uh, last talk installment. We've had actually two previous talks where we talked about uh, halal investments as well as personal finance. So we are ending off our Let's Talk series this year with cryptocurrencies. We're very, very honoured and uh, blessed that you could join us today. And we are also very honoured to be joined by two uh, guests that later, inshallah, we'll be introducing. So uh, on the next slide, please. So at any point of time, um, if you guys have any questions, do head down to our Slido website with the code LTC21. Uh, you can put, input it into the website to access the portal where you can ask questions to the guest speakers. So uh, subsequently at the end of the session, we will actually be collating all your questions and be holding a Q&A session with the speakers. Thank you. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, some background uh, information before I'll introduce our speakers for tonight. SMU Islamic Business and Finance Society is a student initiated um, wing constitu constituted under SMU MS, we have a vision to cultivate and promote the growing interest in the fields of Islamic business, law, economics, and other faculties of studies among the student population in SMU and other tertiary institutions within Singapore. So for our overseas friends, SMU uh, mean, uh, stands for Singapore Management University. So it aims to serve as a platform for students with an inquiring mind and common interest in the field of Islam and business studies to get together to explore the vast potential and possibilities in this area and subsequently form an appreci appreciation and understanding of Islamic traditions pertaining to business and finance. All right, uh, next slide, please. So the agenda of the talk for the night is as shown. Uh, and inshallah, at the end, we will end with a Q&A with the Slido link. So on the next slide. So before I pass our time to the speakers and introduce the speakers, uh, I'll just give a short introduction to the state of cryptocurrencies in Singapore as our speakers are from overseas and they will be sharing their views uh, from their experiences as well. So uh, for those who are beginners to cryptocurrencies, essentially they make use of a blockchain technology and uh, what it is, is a distributed decentralized ledger that records the uh, provenance of a digital asset. So not just in finance itself, blockchain technology can be applied in many, many other sectors such as robo-advisory, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, new banking or open banking, smart contracts, halal ingredients, traceability system, Wakov, Zakat and Farah applications, and central bank digital currencies, and it's best to be packed to go. So next slide. So within uh, the region, as far as locally, uh, there have been concerns with cryptocurrencies investing by uh, several Islamic organizations in Singapore, it's MUIS, but Pergas, and overseas like Malaysia will be their Shire Advisory Council. So uh, in Singapore, MUIS has not provided a written statement to date, but general scholarly perceptions towards cryptocurrencies are inclined towards cautiousness. Uh, and the main area of, uh, of their interest when it comes to cross-analysis with the objectives of Sharia uh, include uh, areas such as digital transactions, initial coin offerings, known as ICO, of, and token design and functions, for example, utility tokens, and uh, as well as uh, governance tokens, something like that. So one of the extract from the papers published in, sorry, uh, the previous slide, please. Yep, uh, yep, okay. So one of the extracts uh, published in one of the papers by Burgas uh, states this, and I think it's a good encapsulation of the, the current state of cryptocurrency in Singapore. So more case studies evidence is needed to advance an economic system that benefits all, and this requires a consensus at a higher body, such as the Islamic Fair Academy. So far, the, the, the scholars have present, presented opinions from a plethora of literature, but they are adamant with its potential in the future. So at the same time, such financial system also comes with challenges, especially from the Shara perspectives. So this is the state of cryptocurrency and its regulation in Singapore, especially the Islamic uh, aspect of things. And we are joined by two speakers today. Uh, next slide. The first speaker is uh, Mr. Khalid Khaulada. He is the chairman of the advisory board of Marhaba DeFi. So... Um, Mr. Khalid is a Senior Managing Director and Head of Credit and Sukut for RJ Fleming & Co. And he advises institutional and sovereign clients with his global perspectives. He is a recognized authority in his field and has addressed investors worldwide as well as audiences at the World Bank, IMF, ECB, and IIF. So Mr. Khalid is also an active innovation leader, uh, in innovation investor, advisor, and board member for a diverse mix of fintech, educational tech, crypto, and Islamic economy startups through his firm, Accreditors Partners. So he has a wealth of experience to tap on. So his most prominent startup role was as 
the chairman of Small Pharma, a pioneering UK biotech that successfully made the trans transition from a startup to public 2021 listing in Canada. So, but uh, Mr. Khalid gained his initial industry recognition from 15 years at Moody's Investor Service, London and Dubai, as well as Global Head Islamic Finance. Head of the GCC banking team responsible for a diverse portfolio of about 60 institutions. He was also a credit committee co-chair for the European, Middle East and Africa banks and a senior member in the GCC sovereign and Sukuk committees after senior roles covering securitization and structured credit in London. Previously, Mr. Khalid spent four years at Credit Suisse in the emerging markets risk team in London. He has also provided over 100 briefings over uh, both regional credit markets and Islamic finance markets to stakeholders such as BlackRock, Fidelity, AIG, Threadneeder, Ashmore, ECM, LIM, Goldman Sachs, JPM, AM, Franklin Temperton, and Blue Bay, amongst others. So his research and views have often been quoted by the Financial Times, Bloomberg, Reuters, uh, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and CNBC, Arabia, as well as other media outlets. So he is an active LinkedIn influencer and a well-respected uh, speaker at conferences with his passionate and dynamic style engaging audiences at the most senior levels in globally for institutions such as the World Bank, IMF, ECB, and IAF. So lastly, uh, he is a keen uh, UAE educational supporter and has lectured students in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Lisbon in Islamic fintech, risk ratings, banking, and Sukuk finance. He holds a, a master's in finance from business, London Business School, a master's in um, advanced information technology and a bachelor's in software engineering from both Imperial College of Science and Technology and Medicine. So we have quite uh, experienced as well as capable speaker with, uh, with us today. And on to the next speaker, we have Dr. Far Farooq Habib on the next slide, um, who is the chairman of the Sharia board of Marhaba Divine. So Dr. Farooq Habib is the co-founder of Alif Technologies in Dubai and Sharia experts in London. He's an expert in Sharia Islamic law, uh, which means for, which stands for Islamic law, finance and fintech. He is an advisor, trainer and product developer by profession with a strong educational background and vast global experiences for more than nine years. He is involved in Islamic fintech and halal digital economy, focusing on crowdfunding, micro-investments, tokenization, decentralized economy, halal supply chain management and Sharia compliance. He believes in enhancing shared prosperity by using blockchain, internet of things, artificial intelligence, big data, and predictive analytics in the halal sector, including Islamic finance. Therefore, he has contributed to several projects, research, corporate training, workshops, and consultation work. He has also developed his own proprietary Sharia compliance and screening criterion for crypto assets, which he applied to Marhaba DeFi. Previously, he was a researcher at International Sharia Research Academy for Islamic Finance, known as ISRA, a research institute under the Central Bank of Malaysia. He is also the co-editor of ISRE Journal of Islamic Finance and a reviewer of rep various reputable academic journals. He also has been doing research at the capital market, Sukuk, banking, and social and ethical finance. He is a prolific speaker and has participated in several international dialogues, conferences, seminars, and extensively written in numerous academic journals, reports, research papers, and business magazines. So Dr. Farooq Habib holds a PhD in Islamic finance from uh, INSEAF in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He also acquired a master's degree in um, banking and finance from Queen Mary University of London, UK. Prior to that, he obtained his master's and bachelor's degrees from University of Karachi, both in economics. So um, he has also received traditional uh, Islamic education through an extensive eight years course in Jamia Ulum, Islamia Banuri town in Karachi as well, acquiring another bachelor's and master's degrees in Islamic studies. Uh, next slide. So right now, uh, I will not delay any further. I'll pass our time onwards to our two speakers to talk about Islamic finance, cryptocurrency, and Marhaba DeFi. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so let me just start with this session with uh, just giving you a brief about uh, cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, and uh, also a, a brief about that, how Sharia perceive crypto assets and, and currencies. So looking at this phenomena, uh, actually uh, you can see that uh, cryptocurrencies is actually a misnomer and uh, crypto assets is actually the correct terminology because uh, what we have seen is that uh, it's, a, it's an emergence of different asset class and uh, there are so many other uh, crypto uh, assets which are not currencies. So because of that, it is, uh, it is 
uh, it is appropriate to call them crypto assets rather than currencies. And uh, this basically also solves a Sharia problem because when Sharia scholars uh, back in 2016 and 17 started looking at uh, 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 looking at uh, the this phenomena, they found that uh, cryptocurrencies uh, are actually currencies and then money. And then and they started applying the definition of uh, crypto uh, current, uh, a definition of economic uh, a definition of currencies and money from Islamic and uh, Sharia perspective and also from economic perspective. And because of that, there was a lot of confusion because uh, cryptocurrencies at that time or even right now, they do not fully reflect the definition of uh, money or currency uh, in their current form. And uh, because of that, uh, many fatwas and uh, also Sharia opinions we have seen saying that they are not Sharia compliant or they are haram because they are not money. And, uh, and, uh, be, and when you are claiming that they are money, so then it's basically uh, 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 an inappropriate or incorrect claim. Uh, so because of that, I think that it is, uh, it is important to understand that it's not money, but of course, like you can have crypto assets in various forms. For example, some of the crypto assets are backed by uh, equity uh, and then, uh, and some of the uh, some of the crypto assets are basically equity based. Some of them are, are commodity based. Some of them are currency based. And uh, those which are currency based are actually can, can be called cryptocurrencies. But other than that, um, they uh, they they should be classified accordingly. And with this classification, actually, it is very easy to apply appropriate Sharia rulings and principles. So this is basically a, a brief introduction, and then I will pass it on to uh, Khalid, perhaps, to add on something here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farooq. So uh, I guess I'll pose a, a question to uh, Mr. Khalid. So uh, the question that we're going to pose him is that, is, is there a potential for the current existing financial system uh, as compared to a de decentralized finance system? Thanks, Kevin. I mean, um, I think it's worth highlighting to the, the people on the call, the existing financial system. At the moment, globally, the world has around 290 trillion of debt. Global debt to GDP is around 360%. This money is not going to get paid back. And so if you look at the financial system globally, which is heavily driven by interest, debt, river, we've built a sort of economic system by making people buy things they don't need with money they don't have. And how do you do that? You use debt. And interest makes it profitable to put people in debt. So for me, I think the global financial system really in highlighted in 2008, the problems with the global crisis, which haven't been fixed. And it seems like the way to fix the problem is more debt, and I think this is an unsustainable approach. Now, a lot of this problem has been created by a centralized system. You know, we trust the banks, we trust the governments, we trust the regulators, etc. But in many countries, they have spectacularly failed. And also, they have really failed people at the lower end of the income pyramid. You know, micro businesses, low income, uh, people who are unbanked, outside of the system. The financial system works very well for sort of middle class and uh, upper income people. They're getting richer and richer, but for people middle and towards the bottom, it's not really working out in a way creates a fair, just and harmonious society. So when I think about DeFi, obviously it's a very complex concept, but simplistically the ability for to have a peer-to-peer -peer economy so people can transact with each other, people can do finance with each other, business with each other without having, um, uh, you know, uh, having to go through big banks or without having to be rejected by banks. So having a decentralized system, I think, is empowering for those at the bottom end of the income pyramid, a bit, uh, income pyramid will enable small businesses. Now, obviously, we're at the very beginning of this journey. You know, cryptocurrency, as Dr. Farouk has highlighted, um, it's, just a, it's just the beginning first step of having some kind of token or means of exchange within an ecosystem. 
but there are many different products, many different facilities that can be built. However, it's still a very young industry. There's still a lot of risk. And um, particularly at Marhaba, these are things that we're focused on. But any um, uh, system needs to make sure that we do protect consumers. This isn't for everybody to just pile in and putting all their money into cryptocurrency because that wouldn't be wise. But this is the beginnings of a system. And hopefully, if um, uh, you know, we can get critical mass, if the community is participating, if we get institutions to participate, this could become an alternative to, um, uh, or a complement, let's say, to the existing system, where, which has let us down so badly. So I think there's huge potential for DeFi. And then within DeFi, Islamic DeFi or ethical DeFi, um, the last thing I'll say, the last global crisis, a lot of it was related to moral failure, greed, corruption, uh, fraud, um, lots of unethical human behavior. There's a lot of challenges within the crypto space right now, a lot of speculation, a lot of greed, a lot of corruption, a lot of fraud. But if you can build an ethical system, one that is built upon ethical principles, you know, religious principles that Dr. Farouk knows so well and will cover later, well, then we have the beginnings of a, of a new system that will hopefully create prosperity for people within the community and share wealth and create growth. That's the hope for DeFi. But again, we're at the very beginning. But inshallah, um, you know, we hope to grow and offer an alternative to the existing or a complement to the existing system. Thanks, Thank you, Khalid. Uh, all right. So for uh, I, we noticed that there are also some newcomers when we look at the at, at the signups when we of the event. So maybe for the newcomers, maybe Mr. Khalid, you could tell us the difference between cryptocurrency and DeFi for 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 a start. Uh, before we go into Mahabab DeFi itself. Sure. I mean, look, um, cryptocurrency is just a means of exchange on a particular network. So if you're thinking of Ethereum or Bitcoin or you know, um, what's the other one, uh, Cardano or even Dogecoin in theory. Um, each network has its own token that within that ecosystem hopefully can be used as a means to transfer uh, value within that ecosystem. The problem is we have probably right now over a thousand, ten thousand different ecosystems being built, each with its own token or coin. And like the dot-com boom back in the internet days, there will be, for every thousand um, uh, coins or startups, there will be one Amazon or one Google or, or, or one uh, Apple. So it really is the beginnings of that stage. And there are so many coins out there. Many of them will ultimately prove to be valueless. Some of them, as we can see, as people are confident, in the underlying chain or the underlying usage of that token, Ethereum, uh, you know, Bitcoin, store of value, Ethereum for its uh, usability of smart contracts. There are many coins vying, but you will see probably in 10 years, there might only be 10 of these coins still left, still left around. Now, so that's, the, that's a token or a coin. The concept of DeFi is about building an ecosystem without centralization. So if you look around you, the real world is full of centralized institutions. You borrow from a bank, you put money from a bank. It's not, um, uh, it's not possible for people who don't know each other to do business, really, or you do it with risk. In a decentralized system, through the usage of smart contracts or code or program logic that set the rules, and in our system, they will be ethical or Islamic based rules, then that way you know within that ecosystem, that kind of, let's say, that walled garden, that the transactions, the assets, the products, everything within that system should be halal. And that um, consumer protections, ethics, um, uh, 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 profit sharing, all these sorts of attributes should function within that ecosystem. So DeFi is really about separating, um, removing the centralized institutions. It's worth highlighting at the beginning, even with Marhaba, we will need to be a bit centralized at the beginning because we need to set the rules. We need to create the product. And at a future stage, 
if we're successful, the more successful we are in designing the protocols and the products to function without us, then the more decentralized we will be. And so in a true decentralized system, it's the community that will drive the decisions, that will drive the governance, that will drive the products, but we're still quite far away from there. And at the beginning, we still need a bit of centralization, but inshallah, over time, that's the goal or that's the aspiration of a DeFi system. No institutions in the middle controlling the asset flows or value flows within the system. Um, Dr. Farouk, I don't know if you have anything else maybe to add. I don't know. I'm okay. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Khalid. Um, maybe to Dr. Farouk as well. Um, before we head over to Marhaba DeFi and, and introduce its product offerings and as not, what is the state of Islamic finance currently uh, and how has the progress been in the cryptocurrency sphere? Yeah, actually, if you look at the Islamic finance industry, uh, as we are talking about the traditional industry, the adoption of uh, blockchain tokenization is very slow. Uh, perhaps like I would say, like it has uh, come to a halt. Uh, due to the reason that uh, uh, the the, the mindset in the in the Islamic finance industry is that like uh, uh, we always uh, try to look at the conventional side first, which is uh, and then try to see the that what what is happening on the conventional side. If technology any product is being adopted uh, uh, there then we try to basically replicate it in a Sharia compliant manner. Not saying that uh, it's a good approach or a bad approach, but that is basically the, uh, the main approach at the moment. That uh, uh, what we see is basically a, a, a flow of uh, adoption of uh, latest technology through conventional side. So because of that, uh, we have seen that like even uh, blockchain adoption and cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, crypto assets are by the way, they are being uh, their adoption uh, has been slow, but uh, it's it has only uh, it has only started uh, uh, picking up some pace uh, in this in this year perhaps. Before that, like there there had been a lot of uh, regulatory rag tech uh, uh, discussions, and uh, it was uh, it after that only we ha we are now seeing the fruit of those discussions in the form of uh, different compliance and regulations. Singapore is, by the way, one of the examples where the regulations are being uh, advanced, and uh, and then they are quite uh, uh, in an impressive way imp being implemented. So in that sense, uh, Islamic finance again. Uh, uh, if we look at uh, any is, uh, institutional level, we see that uh, to my, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen any Islamic bank uh, at the moment who has, uh, which has adopted any uh, crypto assets or tokenization or cryptocurrencies, uh, even back in their treasury uh, activities. Uh, but uh, and also one of uh, another important factor was basically the the confusion regarding the sharia compliance of this phenomena and uh, since 2016 i have been talking to various uh, top sharia scholars in in uh, in islamic finance and uh, trying to convey the message that uh, we need to look at them objectively rather than focusing on on the journalism and uh, the, the news uh, surrounding this phenomena, because uh, so many times those news are, uh, are basically created uh, based on, uh, on thrill and to be, get people excited. So like you, you, you wake up and then you see that, okay, $10 million had been hacked or there is a rug pull, something like that. And then you get excited. So it's basically a, 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 a way of selling news but rather or not, Sharia has to look at it objectively at this phenomena from this angle is again a question. So, because if I, if I may go deep into something, then the key fit, Islamic legal characterization is a very important phenomena and a process where you try to understand the, the exact nature of a thing before, before you can apply the Sharia ruling on it. And, uh, this is quite important so that we need to look at, uh, at, the, at the thing itself first 
and try to define it and its legal characteristics before we can basically apply any Sharia ruling or have an opinion, whether it's haram or halal. So that is another factor, by the way, that uh, holding uh, that is holding Islamic finance to be pro in that uh, in, in this uh, in this field. But uh, I think uh, I have been observing since uh, 2019 that uh, many Sharia scholars are, ten, are tending to review their, uh, their views, uh, previous views and reconsidering them. Uh, I, I remember that I gave, uh, I, I, I participated in a panel discussion uh, organized by Pargas and uh, FSEC back in 2019. And uh, I gave my view at, at that platform also that like we need to look at those uh, phenomena objectively so that like Islamic finance can benefit from uh, from this phenomena, if if not specifically crypto assets, but uh, blockchain and tokenization is surely a, a phenomena uh, which we Islamic traditional Islamic finance industry can can uh, uh, can basically uh, looked at it and uh, and also can benefit from it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farouk, for that uh, great introduction as well as um, Sakhalid for giving us an introduction to DeFi. So now uh, the, the stage is set, right? Uh, the introduction of DeFi as well as the state of Islamic finance in, in cryptocurrency industry as well as DeFi. Um, right now, let's talk about Marhaba DeFi. You know, uh, maybe you guys could tell us what are some product offerings, you know, how was Marhaba DeFi founded and what, what is this vision? Uh, Kevin, if you permit me, maybe I'll just show some slides it'll be sure. i'm a believer a picture paints a thousand words so um you know i'm a great fan of pictures and let me just try to um share my screen uh can you see my screen Kate? yep you can see it great so this will just be like very quick um we have three core principles ethical inclusive simple um, just some stats, I'm sure you know about the cryptoverse. Two trillion is the market cap. Uh, 109 billion a day of cryptocurrency volume. If you looked at the top 10 coins this year, you would have made a 2,500% return, which is quite incredible. But there are over a billion people who are excluded from this ecosystem. Those who have faith-based uh, obligations, so... Um, uh, Muslims predominantly, but also Christians and Jews also have the same prohibitions in terms of river exclusion, lack of wealth, social status. There's over 1.7 billion unbanked people in the system. And then complexity. There are many people who very sensibly should stay out of this space because it is quite complex and it's quite hard to navigate. We look to solve those three problems. So, you know, we are a halal system. We provide equal access to everyone. And ideally, we would like to believe our system is simple and user-friendly. Here's an interesting statistic. I mean, the Islamic finance sector is worth about $3 trillion. Most of that $3 trillion is held in banks. I think it's around 85%. Now, that's more than 20 times bigger the entire DeFi space. So if you can pull some of that Islamic liquidity into DeFi, it will have a huge impact on the DeFi system. So that's ideally what we're trying to do. As we know, um, Sharia ethics, you know, are the basis of what we're doing. And nowadays you hear a lot about ESG and ethical banking and ethical finance. I mean, uh, we've had ethical finance for hundreds of years and it's Islamic Finance was ethical to begin with. So it's interesting to see the world has come back almost to some of the religious underpinnings of finance. The last slide, this is really just showing the, the vision of Marhaba, what we hope to achieve. Phase one is a wallet, NFT marketplace, liquidity harvester, chain, cross-chain aggregator. And then phase two, we have governance and DAO, interest-free lending, borrowing, uh, decentralized philanthropy governance. So obviously we have quite an ambitious vision for our ecosystem, but we are building it on top of proven world-class tech. Um, and not to mention security is utmost. So this hopefully gives you a bit of a sense 
of what we're trying to do. It's quite ambitious, but we think um, there's a place for this, hopefully in the world, and the community will come together and support our vision. Um, I will stop sharing and back to you, Kevin, if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Khalid. Uh, something that really piqued my interest was that we could pay our zakat with our cryptocurrency holdings. So that's something that uh, was, was really interesting to me. Um, all right, so uh, thank you for uh, sharing about the cryptocurrency as well as the decentralized finance industry as well as Marhaba DeFi. So now we go a little bit about some career opportunities in the industry as well as in the Marhaba DeFi. So as, as you guys are board members in, in Marhaba DeFi, what do you guys um, think that um, are the general qualifications that is required to work in the cryptocurrency industry? Any specific skill sets or any specific qualifications that will help someone succeed in the industry? I mean, this is a tough, um, it's a tough question because the industry is so new. Um, but obviously, you know, science, engineering backgrounds, computing backgrounds. I mean, nowadays, frankly, anything needs technology, fluency. Um, and uh, I mean, look, there are no real big established companies. There's a lot of startups in this space. And, and so the, in terms of uh, working in startups, you know, finding good co-founders, good teammates who will work with you, being a solo entrepreneur is, is, is always tough. So um, as someone who I've invested in quite a few startups, you know, I tend to try to look for at least, uh, you know, two or three founders. So definitely look at, look amongst your friends who are also entrepreneurs, who are also enthusiasts and, and combine with them. Um, but yeah, in terms of jobs in the industry, I mean, really, I would say it's the same rules for tech. You know, if, if, you know, get into a tech company, start somewhere, get good discipline, get good governance and uh, take it from there. But um yeah, no, no real um, blueprint as yet, uh, Dr. Farouk. I don't know if you have any other suggestions. Yeah, I think that uh, it's uh, uh, what Khalid has said. I just want to add that, uh, of course, uh, since this crypto space is growing in uh, multi-dimensionally in different directions, so of course uh, we also need some uh, domain-specific uh, expertise as well. For example, Sharia is uh, is on top of them. Uh, in my mind, that uh, we need Sharia experts who are well versed in uh, uh, experts who are well versed in uh, in crypto as well or in technology even. So it's it does not have to be crypto or blockchain, but uh, any technology because uh, what I see is like even there are a lot of challenges uh, uh, from the Sharia perspective using artificial intelligence, for example. So it's not blockchain not crypto but something related to technology so i think that we we really need uh, that kind of breed uh, which can uh, which can basically understand technology and also uh, the impact of that technology in a, in, a, in a social framework or social environment so that is also important and then can and can guide the people in the right way so i think that uh, uh, economist uh, financial experts and um, uh, Sharia experts and uh, also people who are well versed in risk management, governance structures are also very much uh, and regulatory uh, environment also who are experts in the regulations, compliance. These, uh, these people are much needed as well in the, in the same industry and they can contribute with their skills and expertise in this niche uh, industry. All right, thank you, Mr. Khalid and Dr. Farouk again for the sharing. Um, all right, so we'll move on a little bit to the FAQ. But before we move on to the FAQ, I would just like to remind everybody that we, we have a Slido and we, you can submit your questions at any point of time in this sharing. Uh, you can also vote on the existing questions. We have already transferred the questions you've submitted to us on your forms to the Slido. So you feel free to go on to vote on the questions that you think are mo most interesting. And we try to cover as many questions as we can later on during the Q&A at the end of the session. So uh, moving towards the FAQ, um, I think the first FAQ uh, will be um, more for Mr. Khalid. Uh, and, he, and he talks about, uh, next slide, please. Why are so many regulators reacting negatively to cryptocurrencies? Um, there's a couple of reasons, but 
first and foremost is probably uh, consumer protection. Um, it, all the rules that we have in place for our existing financial system, a lot of them are there to protect the consumer, protect the unsophisticated um, person from uh, frauds or scams. And uh, as you know, money is, um, or loss of money can be a very traumatic experience for a community, for a family or a person. And there is no shortage, unfortunately, of people willing to take advantage. Now, in the existing financial system, we've had decades um, to understand the market, understand the risks, and by and large, you know, the, the, the practices for consumer protection are quite well established. Um, and in the crypto space, unfortunately, you know, because it's so new, as Dr. Farouk was highlighting, even the regulators, we need much more domain expertise and regulation in crypto. And the regulators are often behind the curve when it comes to what's happening. And they have to tread a fine line between allowing innovation, which is very important for any society or any economy, and protecting consumers. And when the market is moving too fast, there are some very fast people who are able to um, you know, uh, defraud or exploit the ignorance of people. So uh, number one is protection. And then number two, which is a bit more... I would say global and a bit more of a macro concern, but most countries, uh, the use of a coin, the use of their currency, whether it's sing dollar, US dollar, pound sterling, etc., is very important to the functioning of the government and of the country. You pay your taxes in local currency, you exchange with people in local currency. If you have a parallel currency, operating in your country, well then, aside from the fact that people can use that parallel system for money laundering and all these usual things that they complain about, from a more sort of Machiavellian level, there's a loss of control, potentially, for the, the government if they don't know how people are spending their money, if they're not controlling the money. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. And I take the example at the moment the money printing that is happening worldwide. If you're somebody who holds US dollars, the Fed is printing trillions and trillions of dollars. Automatically, by mathematical certainty, the value of that dollar has to fall. Now, typically, who holds their money in cash? It's poorer people or lower income people. Rich people tend to own assets. Property, equity, businesses, and so you can see there that control of the currency is, I would say, uh, being abused in the favor of just endless debt, and people will suffer from this. So that's another reason why regulators are reacting negatively. Consumer protection is one, but loss of control or sovereignty over the economic system in your country is another one. And uh, that's, uh, those two, I would say, are the key drivers for negative reaction. If a country operates well, as in runs its book or runs its balance sheet in a prudent way, not spending too much money, not wasting too much money, not having too much debt, Singapore is probably one of those few countries, then um, a country that runs its finances well doesn't need to fear from crypto. A country that runs its finances poorly, those are the ones who may need to think about the impact of crypto in their system. And so you will see that failed countries, whether it's Venezuela or, 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 country, not, or countries facing economic challenges like Lebanon, these countries, the people will turn to a new currency because the government has failed them. So that's another key thing to think about um, in terms of the future, uh, it's interesting for most sectors of the economy, we don't like government interference. We believe the private sector is best. But in the, in the provision of money, it's always in the control of the government. So it's a bit of a, a different perspective. But I, I hope that's a, a comprehensive answer to your question. Thank you, and, and definitely a comprehensive answer. Uh, I'd like to also ask a follow-up question. Um, 
in your opinion and in your experience, what do you think are the steps needed uh, eventually for regulators to open up more to cryptocurrencies as we are seeing some of the countries who are opening up now? What do you think uh, is needed and are some of the steps to get there? The first one is human capital. I mean, you can see there are some countries, Switzerland, Singapore, uh, UAE, that are moving very fast because, look, in my view, this is the future. Um, this could be um, uh, as revolutionary as internet was for the sharing and provision of data. I think blockchain is just as important for the sharing and provision of value, sharing, moving value around digital assets. And the, the countries that are reacting quickly, obviously they've hired smart people, educated people who are learning. So human capital, I think, is the first challenge for regulators to get comfortable. Then um, engaging with the private sector, working with entrepreneurs, working with startups to really understand what's happening. And then also, as I touched upon before, making sure that the system is uh, run in a way that protects consumers, that they're not exploited. And although it goes against the anonymous, maybe ideals of the um, of DeFi or or some of the the networks, KYC, as in know your customer, anti money laundering, is is very important. You know, um, as much as I'm a fan of decentralization, as much as I'm a fan of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, I do believe we need checks and balances to make sure that um, these networks are being used for uh, halal or prosperous purposes and not for illegal or exploitative purposes. And if you want that sort of protection in the system, um, regulators are going to be the ones who need to get up to speed and, and bring some of that in, hopefully not too much, not to squeeze the system. but once the system has some kind of protections, has some kind of um, checks and balances, then I'm sure uh, regulators will become much more comfortable around DeFi and less fearful. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll move on to the next question on the next slide. Uh, and this is this question is for Dr. Farooq. What is the Sharia screening process for Marhaba DeFi? Sorry, doctor, I think you're muted. Um, yep. Okay. okay, it's an interesting question. Um, so what we do is like we have a proper Sharia governance board at Marhaba. And uh, there are currently three members uh, in the board, uh, which have uh, th those who have uh, crypto asset uh, knowledge and uh, blockchain knowledge and also the domain knowledge of uh, traditional Islamic finance. Uh, regardless to say about the fiqh and sharia knowledge as well so and they have uh, we have experienced uh, people who who have been uh, doing uh, and advising uh, doing uh, sharia audit review and also advising different projects so with that knowledge and uh, perhaps uh, i can i can also add on to that that uh, my phd thesis was also uh, relevant to uh, uh, Islamic capital market where I touched upon the screening methodology of stocks. So with that insights, I was uh, able to basically create a screening methodology of crypto assets as well. Uh, but of course, since uh, this niche market and this new uh, industry has been constantly growing, new uh, methods, new processes, new tokens, new protocols, algorithms are being introduced. Uh, because of that, uh, we are also changing accordingly the, the Sharia screening process. And uh, it's quite dynamic at the moment because uh, uh, most of the time what we have found that uh, unlike stocks or shares of a company, uh, 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 the, 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 there are many factors which are subjective and qualitative. So it's really hard to gauge them uh, from, a, uh, from a mathematical or quantitative perspective and uh, to give a very correct answer. So you have to basically, it, it, it also boils down to the, to, to the analogy and the logic behind uh, evaluating and doing the analysis. So 
with that context, what we do is like uh, we first uh, uh, have an initial ana uh, analyst uh, from the Sharia board to review a protocol, for example. So like, uh, but before that, let me just tell you that like there are two sets of uh, Sharia review. So one is basically reviewing the third party protocols or our tokens that can be uh, incorporated in Marhaba DeFi uh, uh, ecosystem in different ways. And the uh, second thing is about the Marhaba DeFi's own product, for example. So these are basically two areas where we are looking. And the third area I can add also is basically the operational side and the governance side. So for example, like Marhaba as an entity, we have to do the review and uh, guide the um, other team and departments to, to become Sharia compliant because we are not only looking at the uh, contracts or protocols being Sharia compliant, but rather uh, Marhaba as an entity has to be Sharia compliant as well. So this is basically a very comprehensive framework that we are working on. So uh, moving back to the protocol review. So what we do is basically first, there is a, a initial analyst or examiner of, uh, of a token and uh, that person uh, uh, creates an initial report. And then after that, uh, there is a reviewer for that report that uh, either endorse the re initial report saying that, okay, that uh, the report is correct. And uh, we, we can consider that protocol or token Sharia compliant. Uh, and then there is a decision-making then we, we discuss first and uh, in a de decision-making round where we finalize the decision on, on that protocol. If let's suppose the, the reviewer finds that uh, the reviewer's findings are different from the initial examiner. So then we, we have a discourse and then we also have a comprehensive discussion. We do, um, uh, and then after discussion, if the, the matter can be resolved and then we have come to a consensus, that would be great. Uh, we can again say that like it's uh, either, sh uh, either Sharia non-compliant or Sharia compliant. Uh, but if let's suppose that uh, we, we, we cannot conclude it uh, given the time frame, then what we do is like we do more research. So we, we put it in the, in, the, in the protocols where we need more research, more information, and we, we set up a time frame for that, and then we, we, we do it. And after the more research and more, uh, more work being done, uh, perhaps like we can bring it again uh, for discussion and see, and see that like if there is a development or not. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, thank you so much for answering so comprehensively. Uh, sorry, yeah, but uh, one more thing is I uh, just wanted to add, sorry, uh, is about the products. What we do is like, it is really good that uh, the Sharia team uh, is uh, being involved, uh, not only in the research, but even like uh, tech ideas. So like uh, when we are trying to create uh, uh, any product or any offering, so Sharia team has uh, been uh, is uh, is is there basically as a part of the research and development team and also on tech ideas and in brainstorming sessions. So from day one, we know that like what we are trying to build, and that is basically give us an edge that uh, we are not uh, going, uh, we are not simply replicating what is available in the DeFi space or even in the traditional uh, space, uh, be it conventional or fi Islamic financial uh, uh, fi finance one. So we basically try to brainstorm that what can work as an idea from the Sharia and tech perspective, and only then we, we try to further develop it. Kevin, if I can yeah. just add to uh, Dr. Farooq's um, sure. comment, because the last point he made is really important because that $3 trillion number that I put on the screen before, as I mentioned, it's mostly banks, I think maybe 2.7 trillion or something is probably banks. And um, Islamic banks pretty much copy um, existing products from the conventional banking system, loans, credit cards, car loans, all these things. And so the innovation at the moment in Islamic finance is, is really about finding other ways to copy existing uh, products. And in my mind, it's actually not very innovative at all. Dr. Farouk's team sits at the heart of, of Marhaba. It's, the, it's his team that come up with the technology guys. The ideas originate in, uh, in Islam, in ethical practices, with the technology. It's not that they're looking over the fence 
and say, oh, let's copy that, let's copy this. Um, and I think that really is a, a difference and, and, again, emphasizes some of the potential of this new system where, you know, rather than just replicating the problems of the existing system, you know, we're coming up with new solutions and the solutions are based on 2,000 years of product development. Right? You know, this isn't something that Dr. Farouk and his team came up with last week or last month. There's, um, you know, if you incorporate, uh, you know, the Abrahamic religions, if you incorporate Islam, there's hundreds and thousands of years of product development. So this is a, a 21st century imagining of some very old established ethical business principles. And that's really, uh, I think, a key element of Marhaba that, you know, we're not copying, we're sort of, you know, the conventional, we're really originating our own based on these ethical and Islamic business practices. Thank you to Mr. Khali and Dr. Farooq. I think um, many of us are pretty interested as well on how to get involved in, in uh, the journey of Marhaba. I think in our slider, we have some questions building up. So we'll move on to the next segment. Uh, and after we have concluded on uh, you know, Mahraba DeFi as well as cryptocurrency, we talk about uh, some career uh, let, you know, pointers from, from both of your experiences in our career sharing FAQ. So on the next slide, we have our first, first question. And I think this question is more suitable uh, for uh, Dr. Farouk on the next slide. So uh, for Dr. Farouk, so uh, Islamic finance is a big sphere, right? And you've had a, a plethora of experiences um, before coming into cryptocurrency. And uh, why do you decide to take a leap to enter the budding crypto in the industry? Um, okay, uh, it's again, uh, my answer is related to what uh, Khaled has uh, expressed uh, previously, that uh, what I have seen is that in the traditional Islamic finance space, um, uh, the, the, the scope of innovation is quite limited. And uh, orig the originality factor is uh, always underplayed and undermined. So, and my, my, as a being a researcher, I have found so many, uh, so many ways and uh, instruments which can be implemented, but due to some of the ifs and buts, because uh, we are talking about the uh, uh, competition, uh, from uh, uh, between Islamic finance industry and uh, conventional financial industry. So because of that, uh, there are so many things uh, that we cannot do in the traditional uh, space. Uh, my, the way I see uh, this whole blockchain phenomena, uh, crypto phenomena and uh, tokenization, Marhaba DeFi is basically at the forefront at, right now as, a, as being a, shari a Sharia compliant DeFi project. But uh, what I have seen is that uh, this, maybe in the future, we may not see Ethereum, we may not see uh, other projects. Uh, although like uh, I am quite optimistic about them, but uh, as a theoretically, I'm, I'm speaking that we may not see them. But what, what uh, this phenomena has, uh, has uh, started is actually irreversible, which is basically decentralization and removal of intermediaries. And, uh, uh, and it, uh, this phenomena has given you a huge space to, to work uh, around uh, as a sandbox. And you can basically create any product and roll it down uh, and you can see the impact and you can see the users uh, if they are attracted towards it and you can see the benefits also. also. So because of that, I think that it's uh, it quite fascinate, uh, fascinated me and, uh, and uh, then I, I got uh, interest uh, um, in this and uh, I got a huge interest in this industry. Thank you, Dr. Farooq. And uh, on to the next question. Um, for Mr. Khalid, uh, we saw you know wealth of experiences in working with many DeFi startups, and we understand that in the crypto assets industry, in the DeFi industry, most uh, you know how careers start there is, is really through a startup, their own project, and not many projects are big enough to actively hire and recruit yet. So, what do you think are some keys to success for DeFi startups for anyone who wants to you know start their own decentralized finance initiative? So I, I think I maybe touched upon this already before, but firstly, um, I, I wouldn't be specific to DeFi startups. 
it's not that I've worked in a hundred <laughs> DeFi startups and I can give you some advice. Um, you know, uh, Marhaba is, um, you know, the, uh, the the only DeFi project in my portfolio. The others are fintech or innovation. Um, no, I, I think as I said before, like the the the, the key to success is the team. Um, I've seen uh, teams with, or I've seen people with good products but weak teams not succeed. I've seen teams with good people, if their product is not working, they then change and they ultimately deliver. So having, you know, in, in my, from my perspective, I would always want to have at least three sort of founders because two people can always disagree. You always need maybe need the third person to mediate or you know to have a consensus. Um, also, in terms of resiliency, you know, when I'm in, investing in a company, potentially, you don't want the whole company to fold if something happens to that um, uh, founder or, or a person. Um, a, a focus on on cash flow. Uh, a lot of companies run out of money, so you know, not being too aggressive. Um, in terms of the spending, um, you know, it's not a, at the beginning, the, there are no riches involved, but, uh, um, you know, you need to have a, a good focus on, on spending. So, you know, uh, you know, control over your budget, um, team, and, uh, you know, uh, stamina, commitment. Uh, I think these are some of the key things. And obviously a good a good idea, some diligence in finding a, a gap in the market. You know, what are you offering that others don't? And uh, and be the best at offering that particular product or service. Thank you, Mr. Khalid. And uh, last question for our career FAQs. Uh, I think this is open to both of you. And uh, a more personal take on uh, uh, and a career in the cryptocurrency industry. Uh, what are, what were some challenges that uh, both of you faced as uh, Muslim professionals in the industry? Um, to be honest, uh, Kevin, Alhamdulillah. I mean, um, you know, I I was lucky enough. Um, born in the UK at a time of 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 strong multiculturalism. Yeah. Uh, the UK. Um, a very sort of uh, well, I should you know because of Brexit, I should I should characterize be more specific. I mean, I grew up in London, and um, uh, at least growing up, I, I can honestly say I didn't really face um, any different mm. challenges uh, as a Muslim. I mean, a very meritocratic society, education values, um, but again, London is a, is a very unique place to to maybe grow up and study and work. So, Alhamdulillah, I've never really faced. I, I would say, as in for Islam in particular, but it hasn't held me back in any way. All right. Thank you. Um, yep. Uh, I tend to agree with Khalid, uh, and uh, I think that uh, being a Muslim professional, I think it gives you an edge because uh, you your perspective is widened, and uh, you 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 have a very rich cultural background, traditional background, where you can see things differently and analyze them in a different manner. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think that uh, those challenges actually become your strengths in the sense that like when, whenever you are uh, looking at things, you are, you are more aware of uh, uh, spiritual and also religious aspect of different things, which maybe uh, are, uh, other people are, uh, are being ignorant or just neglecting them. Uh, but uh, uh, for them, you are, uh, this, these things are important. For example, like I, if I give you an example of Marhaba DeFi. So it has been a very, it is a very, very special uh, project. But, and so many people, whether they are religious or not, they, they, say, they, they also tend to agree with this statement that uh, it's a very special project because it has some uh, spiritual, religious, and ethical social connection in the, uh, in the, in the space where everybody is talking about uh, uh, 
uh, APYs, yields, and 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 rug pulls, right? So, so I think that uh, because of that, you it gives you an edge and, and a different angle and perspective to analyze thing, and then gives better product. So, I mean, yeah, it's not a challenge, but an opportunity for me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farouk. And uh, maybe I can add on myself as well, uh, because I recently did an, uh, a cryptocurrency internship in, in summer. So uh, I probably was not a Muslim professional in the industry, probably more as a participant at a point of time in my internship. And I think one of the big challenges for us is probably to you know identify assets that we can uh, purchase or not. We are unsure whether it's Shara compliant or not. So when, when we actually in, in my internship, where I found out about Marhaba DeFi and, and other uh, organizations who are also doing Shara screening for cryptocurrencies, it, it came as a big relief. So I think the circumstances in which uh, Singaporean Muslims, as well as uh, is similar to uh, the circumstances that you guys face, uh, as in uh, Mr. Khalid and Dr. Farouk, we are quite unrestricted in terms of uh, the, the infrastructure and facilities within our economy, as well as uh, uh, our, our, our workforce. Uh, to participate in the cryptocurrency and DeFi industry. So you know, probably in technical terms, we don't really face any much uh, hindrance or challenges as a Muslim professional in, in, uh, in, in the cryptocurrency itself in Singapore. So similar to what you guys have mentioned. So thank you for sharing about the experiences you guys have drawn from your careers. And thank you for sharing about Marhaba DeFi and give up, giving us an introduction, uh, uh, as, you know, increasing our awareness in, in the industry in general. So uh, before we, we zip over to the uh, Q&A, um, which is on Slido, we've been building up a list of questions already. Um, I would like to just take a few minutes of everybody's time to make an announcement um, from Islamic Business and Finance Society. Uh, unfortunately for the um, Singaporean Muslims um, only, uh, as we are unable to expand our scope to the global scale, uh, we are trying to start an initiative or, or rather we start an initiative called Career Partners. And essentially this aims to link up uh, Muslim students who are looking for internships or Muslim professionals who are looking for full-time jobs to uh, the possible jobs that they are available. And, and the perk of you know, finding a job through career partners is that the partners who have onboarded with us, they know the expectations of what Muslim professionals require. For example, your daily prayers or Friday prayers. And they've committed you know, to ensure that these uh, commitments are, uh, you, know, are able, you guys are able to fulfill it. So uh, it's called 2.0 because we actually released last year on our website. But uh, this year, we're taking a different approach, a more accessible approach to create a Telegram bot uh, on, on Telegram. So do scan a QR code to join our channel. And uh, right now, it's still in development. But when we are done with the uh, initiative, we will definitely announce it on the channel and uh, we make it available for everyone to use. So yeah, please, please do scan the QR code to join our channel and, and we will provide any further updates uh, from there, inshallah. Okay, on to the FAQ. Uh, sorry, on to the Q&A. Um, all right, so right now, um, I'm... I will just um, reiterate the Q&A Slido code is LTC21. And I think the link has been sent on the chat already. So I'll just uh, quickly go to the first question, the, the, the most popular question on Slido, uh, as we are slightly short of time. So um, the most popular question is, is that, um, it seems that anyone can start their own cryptocurrencies and popularize and monetize them. Is that true? Uh, I don't really have a good, a good answer for that, Dr. Farouk. I mean, look, clearly, I mean, going back to something I said before, there's a lack of regulations. Um, there's, you know, all you need is technical expertise. And there's an ecosystem out there that will support entrepreneurs to get out there and to launch projects. So, um, yeah, I think motivation and skill uh, and ability nowadays is all you need to to launch. Um, but uh, I'm not sure, Dr. Farouk, anything else you would add? <laughs> yeah, I would like to just say yes. Techno uh, technically, uh, the answer is yes, because uh, the technology, if you would like to do it, you can do it. But uh, the, the most challenging parts are popularization and monetization. It's not very, it's not, it is, these two things are not very, very easy. So they are super, super hard. And, uh, uh, and uh, what I would like to just add that like uh, previously, it may be uh, a little bit easier uh, before 2017, but uh, now we are living in, a, in an era where people are uh, keenly and uh, 
very carefully looking at this phenomena. So, and uh, regulators and institutions are also, uh, also taking keen interest in that space. So it's not very immature space. Because of that, uh, it's not like anyone can just start it and then uh, popularize and monetize it. So it's, it's really difficult by the way. And then now, uh, since the uh, regulations are coming in, so it's, uh, again, it's not uh, easy to, to comply with the re regulatory requirements as well. Thank you for that. All right, um, the next question is, um, what are the next steps for us present uh, in this talk? How do we begin contributing to a safe, fair and halal DeFi economy that will benefit everybody? Unfortunately, the, the answer to that was a bit self-serving. I mean, like, um, you know, obviously, you know, that's our vision. That's what we're trying to build. And, um, you know, it'd be great to have like-minded people as, as part of this Marhaba uh, community. But even beyond that, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I mean, look, there's, in terms of participating in the halal ecosystem, there aren't actually many alternatives out there. Um, so yeah, I don't want to promote uh, uh, Marhaba too much, but I, I guess this is the reason why we think we are doing something different and special, inshallah. And uh, I guess a follow-up question to that will also be, um, how far along is Marhaba DeFi uh, with its progress to roll out its products? And what will be the first few products that will be launched in the, in the coming months? Um, yeah, so I mean, that's a reasonably easy one. I mean, we're targeting um, a launch in October uh, of our, um, our IDO date, and there should be a soft launch of the wallet, the Sharia compliant um, Sahel wallet and an NFT marketplace. And then over the next 18 months following that date, we have the sort of liquidity harvester, which is like, a, a, you know, a product which will hopefully generate you some returns from the ecosystem, halal returns, um, a cross-chain DEX aggregator, so allowing you to participate across different blockchains, and then version twos, and then, you know, as mentioned, as you, as you saw in that diagram before, there's a whole uh, roadmap. But I mean, look, if you go to the website, um, you know, you should be able to gain access to materials around our ecosystem and product. So uh, I would just recommend um, the community head there. We also have a, a very active Telegram group, group, which is where we share a lot of uh, product ideas, developments, a lot of community thinking. So, you know, join that group and you will stay informed on your phone from a minute, from a minute to minute uh, basis. Because obviously, look, things can change. And, uh, we, you know, we do our best to hold ourselves to the timeline that we are sharing with the community. But as you'll know, any startup project has challenges, uh, internal, external, et cetera, the market. And, uh, you know, the NIA, the intention is really for an October launch. Um, and we hope to fulfill that ambition. Thank you for that. And uh, the next question will be addressed to likely um, Dr. Farooq. Um, so um, the question goes, I'm a beginner and I'm looking to buy uh, crypto assets like VeChain and Zilliqa, uh, for example. So may I ask where to look for compliance in these coins? Uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, everyday question. Actually, I receive uh, messages uh, on WhatsApp that, okay, can you look into this protocol? Is it Sharia compliant or not? Uh, let me just uh, share the challenges uh, with you uh, very briefly that uh, when we are looking at a at, a, at any protocol or any token or any crypto asset. Uh, it's not a very uh, static formula which we apply and say, okay, the end result is if, if it is one, then we will call it uh, halal. And then if it is zero, then it, we will call it uh, haram. So <clears throat> it's quite dynamic. So like we need to look at the protocols uh, uh, infrastructure how the uh, the token is being issued, what is the utility or usage of that token, if there is a project underlying it, or if there is a product or, or a commodity or an equity or 
uh, or our, uh, or for example, like reserves also, for example, uh, fiat currency reserves are there behind it. And uh, we also need to see that, okay, what is the purpose and objective of that? We also need to see the partnerships uh, or, and the whole ecosystem that how this uh, uh, token is uh, being uh, defined and be, uh, is uh, put uh, has been put into work uh, and uh, how it is basically communicating uh, communicating with different stakeholders and uh, also uh, uh, community actors. So in that sense, uh, it's a very challenging. Sometimes, like I spent uh, three to four days on one protocol to actually. Uh, understand that okay what is the sharia requirement and then whether it fulfills the sharia requirement or not so it's not a uh, not a very easy task uh, <clears throat> after that what i can say is that um, i do not want to actually uh, specifically mention any 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 protocol whether it is sharia compliant or not uh, but i can just tell you that okay bitcoin and ethereum are quite famous so uh, of course these are sharia compliant um, uh, other than that, where you can find that whether a protocol is Sharia compliant or not. So we are building our Sahal wallet. Marhaba DeFi uh, has a product, which is uh, Sahal wallet. It is, it's a crypto wallet. Uh, inshallah, the, the intention is to basically uh, list uh, or avail all the available tokens or protocols will be Sharia compliant. So that is basically one source of that, uh, where you can find the Sharia compliant uh, uh, tokens or protocols. Um, we are also trying to basically see different uh, other solutions which can be which can be beneficial for the whole uh, community, uh, which is looking for for Sharia compliant protocols and tokens. So other solutions are also uh, being thought upon. And other than that, Sahal Wallet is there. Thank you, Dr. Farooq. All right. So in the interest of time, we will uh, limit our <coughs> in a to about two more questions. And uh, I, I think another question, another very general question uh, is, is, is also the next one. So um, for someone who is still a beginner or is still skeptical about crypto assets, do you think that it's a good idea to maybe uh, start investing in crypto stocks for exposure? Um, actually, yeah, that's something like um, there's a couple of, companies that are listed um who's uh invest in, in in DeFi, so they're listed on stock exchanges and uh to be listed on a stock exchange you know you need to be uh transparent do regulatory filings there's a due diligence that that goes through so i think if you do a google you know which equity stocks are the best for exposure to DeFi or to crypto there are listed equity companies where a lot of their you know uh, profits may be driven so that's a different way to take exposure um, the other thing if you do participate directly just make sure that if you're if you are participating in tokens or coins you operate with prudence you know you should be not you should not be putting your life savings or even a substantial part necessarily of your savings, you know, it's got to be money that you're willing to risk, even willing to lose, because especially at this point in time, you know, they can go up and down much quicker than, uh, you know, most of the listed equities. So any prudent part of your wealth strategy, portfolio strategy, only a limited amount should go into the most risky assets and the rest should go somewhere in the middle and somewhere into the safe. So, Depends on your strategy. Obviously, some people are very aggressive, very pro risk, and if you can, if you're ready to risk, then fine, go. But um, indeed, uh, if you do a Google, some companies will come up that are heavily exposed to crypto or heavily exposed to. Um, I think there's one exposed to DeFi as well. So um, that's a good way to take some exposure. All right, all right. Thank you so much. And um, the last question from our slide though will be, uh, this was this just got voted up. So, will bitcoins, big bitcoins like BTC or ETH collapse and disappear out of the blue? Since this is all in a virtual economy or virtual world. Do you want to take that one, Doctor Farouk? <laughs> okay, just let me just start with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, in 
when I started my research back in 2016, I, by the way, like I found Bitcoin in 2014 and uh, I started doing research because uh, I had uh, a very, and still I have a very keen interest in Islamic monetary policy and, uh, and, uh, and then how the money, uh, the forms of money in Islam. So that was basically my topic. And then I, uh, I started looking into this phenomenon uh, back in 2014 and then officially started doing re some research uh, in ISRA uh, uh, in 2016. And uh, so this was the question basically that it is, uh, it is something very, very virtual and it can collapse and disappear. <clears throat> Uh, for BTC, for example, uh, there are more than 10 million nodes, although like uh, some of them are, uh, are quite centralized because those nodes are being owned by, by a central co uh, company or corporation. But uh, again, uh, uh, there are 10 million basically. So you can say that like there are 10 million copies of the ledger and uh, they are being distributed. So even like uh, uh, one copy survives you is still uh, there is a hope for survival of the whole ledger and also the the transaction and the kind of system itself so in that sense uh, the collapse and disappearance of ptc is uh, is not very easy and that is why uh, even like uh, the blockchain itself uh, of uh, bitcoin and ethereum are unhackable what is what can be hacked is basically an exploit of a smart contract or, or let's suppose that you have an exchange and you can exp uh, um, you can you can hack it, or basically you can steal someone else um, uh, funds from uh, from uh, from getting uh, access uh, uh, in uh, from in a computer system. But uh, again, the the blockchain itself, since it is quite distributed and decentralized, uh, it is it is very difficult for for it being collapsed or or disappear. Um, so in that sense, uh, theoretically it is possible, but uh, practically it is it is very very super difficult. Thank you uh, for that clarification. All right, okay. So um, I realized that there's actually a question in the chat, and pardon the background. I think there's a flame. Uh, there's a plane flying past my my block. Um, all right, and I, I think that this question is probably a pretty re relatively straightforward question to answer. So I will just end off with this question from the chat. So uh, the the brother asked, "Assalamu alaikum to all. I am a BCA graduate with experience in IT ops, and now I want to shift my career to something like this, which contributes to our community. So please suggest uh, any." actions that I can take from now? Uh, I think Khaled can, can take this question. Sorry, ap apologies. Um, uh, Kevin, can you just uh, uh, repeat the question quickly? Sure, no worries. I am a BCA graduate with experience in IT ops, and now I want to shift my career to something like this, which contributes to, to our community. Please suggest some actions for me to do next. <laughs> Look, uh, I'm a huge believer in technology. I think um, uh, your generation is present at a critical inflection point of our of our history of of our development, where you know apps or products built by a few people can impact thousands or millions of people. So, you know, technology also um, uh, innovation uh, scope for growth. So. Yeah, not a very sophisticated answer. I would just say focus on technological innovation um, and, uh, you know, try to find an application in the real world that can benefit from that technology impact and, uh, and head in that direction. But um, the last thing I will add, look, I mean, my own background, obviously I have a very... Um, normal academic background and even my corporate background was very institutional. I only really came into the startup space quite late uh, in my career. Um, should I have done it earlier? Should I have done it later? I mean, my institutional background, you know, working at a big company, a blue chip company with good corporate governance, with good policies, etc., is its own school. Um, you know, too often, if you go straight into startups, you know, you lack a bit of maturity, you lack a bit of governance, you lack a bit of risk management. So 
you know, I don't want to say, um, you know, go get a job in a good company and then leave to do your startup. Obviously, you can do both. But, um, you know, each person needs to work out their personality, what they're, where they're strong. Some people like discipline and support. Other people hate it and want to be free. So, um, but in both tracks, I would say just try to orientate yourself towards something linked to technology. Um, I pick finance in particular because finance impacts so much of the world, both negatively and positively, that technology and finance is probably the uh, one of the quicker ways to try to make an impact. But, you know, for every 100 um, companies, you probably have 98 failures and two successes. So it's not for the faint hearted. Not to put you off, I hope, but, uh, you know, you have to start somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Khalid, and I hope that answers your question, brother. So uh, thank you, um, everybody, for attending our last Let's Talk event about cryptocurrency. Uh, we hope that this event has achieved its objective of you know, sharing about the cryptocurrency industry, the decentralized finance industry, sharing about career opportunities, as well as um, what Marhaba DeFi is doing. It's really, truly an exciting project. We are blessed and honored to have uh, two of their board members, uh, Dr. Farooq and uh, Mr. Khalid, with us today. Uh, thank you both of you guys for, for sharing so much about your, from your experiences and from your expertise. It's, it's an honor to have you guys here today. Alhamdulillah. All right. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Like a lot. thank you. So at this point of time, we would like to ask for your feedback um, and you can assess the feedback from through this uh, QR code. Uh, do let us know how we can do better uh, in crafting uh, relevant topics for the next uh, few talks that we're going to have later this year, as well as any of the uh, in in interesting speakers or initiatives that you guys would like to hear about. So uh, we'll also send the feedback uh, link into the WhatsApp group as well as your email so that you can assess it after the talk. So um, before we end, I'll just like to request a special favor from everybody because we're going to do a short photo taking uh, to commemorate this uh, session. And I guess we'll, we'll give everybody a short 10 to 15 seconds while I continue talking to put on your last minute makeup or, or maybe put on a nice hat or something while my assistant Adil helps to take a photo at the end uh, using the gallery view. So it seems like we have more than a page of uh, participants. So if uh, enough of us, you know, on our camera, then we have to take two photos. So yeah, we'd like to request everyone to turn on the cameras for a while so that we can, uh, you know, include everybody in the photo later on. All right. Okay. Anyone else who and is able perhaps to like uh, later we can create an NFT out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we definitely look to upload this onto Sook Marketplace so we could uh, sell it. <laughs> marketplace. Inshallah. All right. Okay. Uh, it seems like mostly everybody is settled and uh, just a few more coming on. All right. If nobody else is going to turn on their cameras, I'll just pass my time on to Adil to help Probably, us. Probably. And if people are not willing to. Um share their faces and they should leave right i mean this <laughs> if you're not going to turn on if you're not going to turn on your camera you're going to spoil the picture <laughs> no, we, 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 can, we can cut out the different uh sections of the gallery view so don't worry uh, about that. okay good stuff all right i'm gonna take the picture now let's hold on everyone just have a big smile just hold on Okay, one more. Well, all right. Thank you, everybody, for the wait. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, right. So. Thank you everyone. So, thank you, everyone, for attending our event today. Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for the sharing. And uh, at this point of time, uh, we really like to thank everyone for, uh, for, for coming on a Monday night. And uh, that's the end of our event. We we'll hope to see you in, in our next few events at the later half of the year. And uh, yeah, looking forward to everyone's attendance and looking forward to get uh, the, our two speakers back at a later time, maybe later next year, inshallah. So thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Okay, you too. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Take care. Bye. Assalamu alaikum Thank you, everybody.